Okay, this is Dr. Victoria Treadaway. Uh, she received her BS in chemistry in 2010 from Linfield College. She got a master's in 2015 in oceanography from the University of Rhode Island Graduate School of Oceanography. She also got her PhD in 2019 from the same school. Um, she is currently a postdoc in Elliott Atlas's lab here at Rasmus, uh, studying the chemical transport in the Asian summer monsoons. Um, Victoria is quite active and she has taken part in four large field campaigns, two over land and two oceanographic cruises. One of those field campaigns is going to be talked about today in her presentation. Um, she has also received multiple awards, including NCAR's Computation and Information Systems Laboratory Core Hour Award, which some of the work she's done for this presentation is how she got that award. Um, Victoria is also an ad hoc reviewer for the Journal of Geophysical Research, and she has been quite involved in relating science to the general public as a writer for Ocean Bites, and translated, uh, which translated, she translated 15 journals into general public available information that they could really take hold of. And she gave lectures a part of the Bay Informed Discussion Series. And finally, I asked Victoria if she had taken up any hobbies over the last few months through the pandemic, and she's actually completed 204 straight days of yoga via Yoga with Adrian, which is quite impressive. So, this is Victoria, and I'm really excited to see you talk. Thank you. That was very Turn your microphone on. I am going to apologize straight off the bat for the uh, smallish audience in person. I will direct myself mostly towards my screen and uh, using this little laser pointer because the majority of you are all online. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about deep convection, but I want to talk about deep convection through the lens of a chemist. Um, and I'm going to talk about two projects. There you go. You're going to have to wait for me. Uh, so the first project took place in summer of 2012, the deep convective clouds and chemistry experiment. This was what I did during my master's degree um, that Kissy talked about. We were based in Salina, Kansas, and two aircraft flew around the central and eastern United States looking for thunderstorms. The second campaign I want to talk about, I didn't get to participate in myself, but I've been looking at the data during my postdoc this year. That was with the NASA B-57 stationed over Guam. And that was in October 2016. I'm going to talk about the flight track that's right there. Now, before I fully jump in, I have learned, as you heard, I went to oceanography school, and my degree is actually oceanography. And so I learned how to convince all of my oceanography partners and all of the faculty and any people that I've talked to why they, as oceanographers, should care about my landlocked, high altitude organic acid work. So, one thing to keep in mind is that. We as oceanographers know that mineral dust deposition under the surface ocean is one way to get both iron and phosphorus uh, for phytoplankton so they can pick it up to nutrients. However, it has to be soluble and bioavailable, and one way that can happen is through the acidification of aerosol waters. And both formic and acetic acid, which I focused on for my PhD, they uh, are the dominant species and solutions setting the pH of rainwater and precipitation throughout the a little bit closer to my Rhode Island home, uh, 30 years before I defended my dissertation, there was a dissertation looking at formic and acetic acid in the marine boundary layer in the North Atlantic Ocean. So this was actually a research cruise, and like all PhD projects, he encountered some data that he couldn't explain and had run out of time and resources to investigate further, but he had some instances where he had higher than expected measurements for both acids and gas phase. And so we hypothesized in his dissertation that it, this downward entrainment as the source for the organic gas phase acids to the marine boundary layer, and that this idea deserved much further study. So thinking about it, it's this long distance transport of the acids or the precursors from continental or distant ocean sources, and this was a possibility to help explain his higher than expected measurements. But how would those acids have gotten there? So this then, jumping 30 years later, 
is sort of where my work would come in. And I looked at the organic acids in deep convective systems. So this is a cartoon of a thunderstorm. This is how I would say a chemist would think about a thunderstorm cloud. Uh, so at a basic level, you have your warm air and the updraft coming into the storm system. Best case scenario, it goes all the way up through and out through the anvil into the outflow. All right, so your boundary layer air that's ingested, the storms through the free troposphere, before it hits the stratosphere, boom, and it flattens out to make that anvil. Uh, you get a lot of those in southern Florida, which are really nice to look at. But of course, like all things in the world, this is a complicated process. We can't forget that there's downdraft and air coming out back through the system. These are clouds, they're not solid walls, so air can be entrained and detrained throughout the whole cloud system. And this doesn't even get into the idea of chemistry within the system and lightning knocks and scavenger gas phases to the precipitation. Lots of fun things to think about. And so as a group, in 2012, we participated in a project to look at the chemistry of this, to sort of treat thunderstorms like a black box and see if we can understand better what's happening inside. So in this project, there were two aircraft. The NASA DC-8 flew the inflow, and the NCAR NSF Gulfstream 5 flew the outflow. So our um, instrument was on board the G-5. Sadly for the organic acids, there were no DC inflow measurements, so I'll talk about how I've estimated that. Uh, the organic acids are really just species of opportunity for us, it's something that we realized our system was detecting. I spent my master's calibrating for that, and then I could look at the data from but the idea is if you have instrumentation on board both aircraft, so we need the same species. You know what goes in and you know what goes out. However, it's different. That can help you get a better idea of what is happening here. So with that in mind, some of these questions are really what drove my time at URI. So at a first level, are foreign acetic acid locked into the upper troposphere through mid latitude deep convection? Um, when it comes to science talks, only time I like spoilers, I like to know what I'm looking at for. So I found out, yes. Uh, today I'm only going to talk about formic acid, but I did find both organic acids and conductive outflow. For those of you who don't think about organic acids, um, that might seem like an obvious sort of question and answer, but both acids are very soluble and so they are heavily scavenged in precipitation, which is why they are the dominant chemical species setting these acidic precipitation around the globe. So I did find that they were lofted through the system, which was cool. And for an air mass storm, so this is a thunderstorm where vertical velocities would be less than 20 meters per second, does shy, size and shape make any difference? And I'll talk about why I even thought this was a question, but it links to this second one down here. So I thought though, no, generally speaking, on the air mass storms that we looked at in the model, there was no big difference in scavenging, especially statistics. And really, this final one here is really what drove a lot of the work that I did, and what would cause elevated formic acid and convective outflow. So on one of these flights, we saw greater than expected formic acid, and then I spent the rest of my time trying to understand what could cause it. Was it just a large surface source that, of course, we couldn't detect because we didn't have inflow measurements? Was it uh, in situ aqueous production, which has always been speculated as a possibility with the literature going back and forth over the years? Was it storm conditions? You know, was it this air mass storm size? How much of a role did pH play? And so this is what I spent my time looking at. I'm not gonna get fully into this because it's a different, another model. In the interest of time, I um, skipped this, but I do have to talk about it later with folks. So this was it. This was the data that uh, set me on my course. Um, on May 21st, 2012, research flight three for DC-3. This was the flight track for the two aircraft. We left the line of Kansas. G5 is in blue, DC-8 is in green. And then we really focused around this Alabama, Tennessee area, looking for air mass storm results. Um, so here I'm showing an altitude profile where altitude is on the y-axis in kilometers. And formic acid mixing ratio is on the x-axis in parts per trillion. So I have this thing called literature outflow. Um, what I mean by this is that there were some great scientists who went through and found case studies for all the different storm sizes marked out inflow and outflow periods for all the rest of his teams. So that is what I call the literature. So I really thank them for all their hard work. Um, and as you can see, it I mean, it wasn't a, a nothing in the outflow for formic acid. It was definitely more than we saw in some inflow measurements over there, some lower altitude work that's on the top. But really it was this 
650 to 700 ppt sort of rain to form a gasset, the around eight kilometers that really made us go, huh. We went, huh, because there was nothing else on any other instrument at the same time that responded in the same way. So the first thing that I looked at was like, okay, well, what, what was going on in the area? So this is some radar observations from this flight. This is just like super basic next red on Google Earth. Um, this was the main storm we were looking at that day, called the convective complex. It's like a whole bunch of little baby air mass storms all together. We sampled the upflow here. And then this tiny little guy all by itself in Tennessee, can you that? that is near where we saw the increase in form acid. So this is what got the curiosity of a PhD student wondering, well, is it this difference in storm sizes and structures that has caused this? Now, um, I don't have a time machine, and I also don't have a giant NSF funding to go back out into the field and discover this. So this is really where, as an observationalist, I've discovered models are super useful. So I use the weather research and forecasting model, version 3.7, coupled with chemistry, or fourth chem. Uh, I don't know how many people in the audience are modelers versus observationalists and how many know fourth chem. So I'm going to keep it super, super basic. There were three domains. I did all of my analysis on this inner domain here which had a 600 meter by 600 meter horizontal resolution. I used what's called the Morrison dull mode of physics scheme. And I did that so that I could use the Mozart mosaic joint gas and aerosol uh, system together. And I wanted those because I really wanted to increase chemistry. So when Worf made its version of these storms, a little bit of nudging and help, uh, this was the convective complex of so this is, again, radar reflectivity for these. Uh, so this was my little convective complex. It didn't replicate the same isolated convective system. I didn't really expect it to. It doesn't really do that in the same way. But luckily for me, there was this isolated storm at the Alabama-Tennessee border, and so I used that as sort of my props. So thinking back to my cloud. So I ran the model. I have a couple storms. How do I look at actually what's going on in this? Really the big tool that we like to use as atmospheric chemists in thunderstorms is the scavenging efficiency. How much stuff makes it from the bottom to the top? And as I talked about earlier, there's all those different things you need to think about. And one way to keep track of the um, air coming in and out of the storm that's not what you wanted is with a chemical tracer, something like in butane. And butane is commonly used because it is isn't soluble and its lifetime is longer than that of a storm. So you know that any difference between N-butane down here and up here is likely the result of anything that's been coming in and out throughout the system. This will be the uh, only math I will show, and it's pretty straightforward. So for each of your outflow measurements, for whatever you care about, you use the N-butane for the outflow, same for the inflow, and then you find it. So the results I'm going to show today, I'm going to show the bar, bar graphs for my uh, formic acid scavenging efficiency. So this is the percentage here from 0 to 100. I have my observations here with a little reminder of what that radar looked like. And then I have my model here with a little reminder of what that's radar looked like. Now this is when I mentioned earlier that we didn't have any inflow measurements for the formic acid, so what did I do? I tried to find a uh, bound for an upper and lower limit for formic acid. So by that I mean, for formic acid's lower limit, I used our own inventory. On the way back to base, we took a spiral down to about 900 meters um, over Tennessee, and so I used that after the name, the G5 spiral, and I used that as one of my inflow proxies. This is my lower limit, because it would be after day convection, because formic acid is so soluble, some of it that would have been removed from the other end, I used uh, actually a different campaign. So the following summer in the same region was a southeastern atmospheric study, I think it was called. Um, and this was actually a group of a bunch of projects all together. And these projects had their own separate goals, but they were able to unify under like one database so that we could look at all of the data together. Um, you can tell that makes me very happy. And so there were two different formic acid measurement teams. And they use the same type of instrumentation. And I, with just really broad swath, 
the whole area of what our storm area would have covered, anything they did below one kilometer. So the reason why I say this is the upper limit is because one of the big goals of this project was to look at ozone levels. So that would favor warm, sunny days, which would favor a formic acid production. On the model side of things, it's a lot more straightforward to look between the two. One, you have the aqueous chemistry of on, cloud chemistry is what it's called, on, and then you have off. Um, on, in the system, the only source is the formaldehyde production of formic acid. There is also the formic acid loss. I just put like the super basic dissolution of formic acid solution as a weak acid. Um, so beyond this, there's actually like loss of it and then the formaldehyde production. So if the aqueous chemistry was important to a net level, that would mean the more formaldehyde is making formic acid and it's being lost for us. And so this is uh, what we found for formic acid. So on the observational end, we'll start here. So this is my upper limit of what I thought would be possible for the inflow. So this would also be the upper limit on the scavenger efficiency. And it was almost 80% um, was removed in this storm system using the literature outflow as well as then my SAS inflow. But notice I'm missing bar here, but really it's just negative which is not originally what I thought would happen, but uh, the outflow was actually larger than the inflow, but looking at it, they were within 30 PPT, so they were within instrument layer. So using the G5 spiral, that basically would have said that if that was characteristic of the region at the time, there was no scavenging at all, or there was so much aqueous production that it compensated for it. Which if we go look at the model, seems extremely likely. So this is definitely the lower limit. So the cloud chemistry off and cloud chemistry on for the convective complex, there was no difference. Which, uh, as I mentioned, the literature has gone back and forth. There is most people think that it's not a great source, but when you see something like 750, you can't explain. You never know. So then I looked at my second storm system, my isolated connection. I just put the little pictures on here to remind you what they look like. Uh, this time we'll start with the model. So you can see that the scavenging efficiency is greater. There's more scavenging in the isolated convection than for the convective complex. I mean, with these error bars, I can't say anything really more than that. In general, for all of the species, for both organic gases I looked at, the highest scavenging efficiency was the isolated convection when the aqueous comes turn on, which would lead me to believe that that wasn't really like that small storm wasn't letting more come through. There's also certain ways about the way the scavenging points are chosen that would play a role in this, which I'm happy to talk about with people, but I'm trying to not get myself too into the weeds. On the observational side, again, you can see the G5 spiral, and um, then you can see this gigantic error bar on SAS, and this is because, as you could predict, when you cover a large swath of an area, in particular for the end butane inflow, it just had a large state. So if we just look at it like generally, um, actually the scavenging efficiency ended up being about 55% and was really nice, like nicely in line, generally speaking, with the uh, cloud chemistry off for foreign acid. So all things considered, um, with no inflow sources and model things as model things always go, I thought that was pretty interesting because it really at least could bring home my, my main curiosity is if they're locked in the paper charge series. And yes, they definitely are. You can see observations, and then the model is moving through as well. This is important because when we think about the global system for these organic acids, they're not everybody's favorite thing in the whole world, but sometimes they forget to include it in the bigger picture, and it plays a role in ozone chemistry and isoprene reactions. And so if things are off there, they are all, you're going to be impacted by not considering the form of I found that statistically, the air mass storm didn't really make a difference for scavenging between the cluster and the isolated, which also in itself is kind of cool. I also looked at the storm, because that's what you do in the model. I looked at the scavenging as a function of time, and that averaged out to be about the same scavenging efficiency. And then finally, so the whole thing that motivated this uh, at the end of the day, it seems the most likely is that there was an unknown large biogenic surface source that was lofting that formic acid to higher altitudes or precursor 
performing acid that then reacted in the sun. And I have to leave that there because sadly, on the time scale that we saw it, the instrumentation that looks at those biogenic precursors uh, didn't have any sample. I do think, though, that uh, storm conditions are going to be favorable if you want to move a lot of formic acid without like, a really large source. And that would mean maybe some slightly more acidic cloud water and some nucleus production. And that was from the parcel model work. So now we're going to step to the other side of sort of this thunderstorm. So I talked about how thunderstorms can move boundary layer air up to the upper troposphere for formic acid that changes its lifetime to a couple days, 20 plus days. And then the way my PhD ended, it just goes away. It's long-term transport. This is sort of the other thing, like where do the long-term transport things go? And so this was from the Poseidon Project. This um, is the AWAS data, so Elliott Atlas and AWAS team at the University of Miami. So not formic acid, more chemicals you're familiar with and potentially more interested in. Um, again, I'd like to know what I'm getting into. So I'm going to show you that there were convectively lofted Asian emissions that were detected over the Western Pacific Ocean. That back trajectory and chemical fingerprinting indicate this air originated from the Indian subcontinent. And that chlorinated, very short-lived substances were elevated 75 to 109 percent above tropical background emissions. And I will talk about why that's such a fun key finding. So recentering ourselves back to Poseidon, this was with the B-57 stationed up at Guam sampling primarily from 14 to 18 kilometers over the Western Pacific Ocean. And so here is the flight track I'm going to talk about today. And I'm going to talk about a couple more species in foreign gas. I'm going to talk about all the things that AWAS looks at, because they look at a lot of really cool things. We look at a lot of really cool things. Um, sort of break down into some major categories. One major category are these long-lived organic halogens things that have potentially more natural sources, like biomass and biofuel burning, um, lifetimes of a year. The ones that everybody loves to talk about, CFCs, the beach CFCs, on their lifetimes of years to decades. These are the things that the Montreal Protocol deals with. And then we have these short-lived, meaning their lifetimes are all less than six months. And we have some natural ones, like iodine and bromine, and then as well as the chloride species here, which are anthropogenic. So keep that in mind, it's anthropogenic. So other big categories we look at, we look at hydrocarbons. These will have northern hemisphere anthropogenic emissions, biomass burning sources. Uh, their lifetimes are days, weeks, and months. And then the organic nitrates, which I will not talk about in reference to Poseidon, um, but will be relevant for the little teaser at the end for what's to come. Um, and these can help us look at equatorial marine photochemical emissions, as well as some of the photochemical uh, reactions from the weeds. So, what I'm showing here are a whole bunch of the whole air samples collected. So, we as a team, we collect air on these aircraft in these cylinders, and then we measure them back on the ground here at UM, upstairs. And each of these little dots represent a different whole air sample. And so that's what the sample number is here. And these uh, are all colored by flight, and I've highlighted research flight five. Uh, so what I'm showing here, I have their lifetimes listed, our methyl bromide and chloride, those are some of those longer-lived uh, natural uh, halogen species. This is dichloromethane, which is one of those very short-lived chlorinated species. Then we have ethyne and, uh, and butane, and these are those hydrocarbons. just want to pause for a moment that this one that has now the shortest lifetime was my long lifetime during my PhD, uh, so I, I do really enjoy that. And what you will notice here, these are all parts per trillion, is that for research flight five, they're all higher. All of these very land-based sources are higher over the upper troposphere uh, Pacific Ocean, and in particular from the light flights around it. Uh, this one is the best comparison. Research flight four was right before it, um, but the air masses they would have sampled from where they would have originated was impacted in part by the typhoon in the region at the time. And so this was like older air, where this was, as you'll see, some. Uh, for those folks who prefer tables to charts or percentages to lines, um, this is the same flight data again, but a different way to think about it. So this is a set of some of the non methane hydrocarbons, those longer-lived halogens, 
and then all three of those uh, chlorinated VSLSs that were all elevated. And so I've highlighted the ones that were all above 100% above the tropical background mixing ratio. Sure. Okay, so what we have here is we have a map of back trajectories from our polar surface. So this green line here is the flight track. And then all of these lines are back trajectories calculated by Ray uh, from the time the sample is collected moving backwards until they hit the point of most recent convection, which are these circles. The circles are colored as the time since convection. So like you know, these are roughly five days before we collected that whole air sample. There was a storm there, that's where the air originated. And the uh, circles are sized by ethyne. And so the plume all had those larger ethyne circles. And a large set of them came from India and the Bay of Bengal, roughly five to seven days before sampling. There is also a set from the South China Sea that was around 10 days before sampling. Now, I, I'm not going to visually show the chemical fingerprinting because I'm still working on the nicest way to present that. But uh, we looked at the ethane, propane, and n-butane from our cans in relation to ethane. And what you can do is you can, using these back trajectories so timing, estimate what the uh, proportion between them would have been based on their lifetime, how they change chemically with time, and then you compare it to literature data. So I looked at literature data from almost all over Asia. A lot of it was from India and China. And then you can pair up and see if you can trace fingerprint uh, where these air masses came from. It did align pretty well with some um, Eastern Indian data. Generally speaking, it aligned nicely with more rural and remote areas versus like the megacities, um, which I thought was interesting. Sadly, there isn't a ton of the BSLS data to look at. Um, there's some literature about it, but the thing with them is their emissions are constantly rising. So it is really, a, if the paper is a few years old, it's who knows if that's the same emissions. But we do have one recent example with which to compare to this. So this was a Say It All, and they have aircraft data. They published this in 2019. So what I'm showing here is their flight tracks colored by altitude. Um, and so you can see here where they were really like low to the ground, down to layer work, is also where there was up to a part per billion of dichloromethane. Now that was one of those chlorinated ESLS as I talked about. That was the one I showed on the graph, and then it was in the table later. That was well over 100% above background mixing ratios. So it's definitely feasible, and they talk about how the production of these chemicals in this region of the world are increasing and how they're able to detect it. So it helps support our idea, along with some other work, that the uh, air originated primarily from the Indian subcontinent. Now, I did hint as to why I would keep talking about these VSLSs and why you might care. Um, there is a growing database of evidence indicating that they, even though they last less than six months um, in the troposphere, that they can actually impact the stratospheric ozone hole recovery. Uh, the reason why a lot of these were used as actually replacements for replacements is because they're so short-lived and they're not huge climate forces. Uh, but, as now we've talked about, if you can move air rapidly from near the surface up to the upper troposphere, you've really shortened the amount of time that it takes to get there, then it can be well within their lifetime that they could get into the stratosphere. And this is what people are starting to see. Uh, so this is from the Nusan 2019 paper. Uh, they say that total stratospheric chlorine from VSLS increased by 61% between 2000 and 2017. Um, and this is in the same years, so this VSLS represented 2% and then 3.4% of overall stratospheric chlorine. So it's a small but significant portion that should increase given the ongoing decline of long-lived chlorine, CFCs, under Montreal Protocol. So basically, while we're doing great things, hopefully declining CFCs and others, the replacements that we're making are actually getting into the stratosphere more than we think and will have a greater impact. And it's not anything super drastic yet, but some of the model work has indicated that it could be uh, delaying the recovery time by a year or two at the moment. So there's certainly things to keep in mind. 
and understanding that this deep convection lofting this air to the UT pretty really rapidly and then allowing that long range transport so that it's clicking into the stratosphere. So to remind you of the key findings, I showed you that there were convectively lofted Asian emissions detected through the Western Pacific. We could tell that they were continental by what they were and how they were afraid of neophytes around it. They're Asian based off of this chemical fingerprinting and then back trajectories, which strongly indicate they came from the Indian subcontinent. And the, the chlorinated, very short-lived substances were elevated 75 to 190% above their normal tropical background mixing ratio for the rest of that flight. If you thought this stuff was cool, but you didn't think I like dug into it enough or included nearly enough campaigns, there's your chance again next week uh, for Valeria's talk. She'll be doing the chemical composition of the tropical Pacific troposphere and tropical tropopause layer. So feel free to check that out. I always have to plug in the team number. Um, and the last sort of visual thing I'm going to do and my teaser that I talked about, I want us to uh, step back our cartoon one more time in scale. So right, we talked about for my PhD work, just the actual transport of the thunderstorm, all the complicated processes. Once you finally get it up there, where does it go? That's when we can see the Asian emissions out over the uh, tropical Pacific Ocean. And if we scale this up to the Asian summer monsoon, and we're gonna talk about this again like a chemist. Uh, so we have this conversion, convergence into the system, and then through the troposphere, and there's the stratosphere, up to the upper troposphere, where the air in the summer gets trapped in the Asian monsoon anticyclone. And then there can be some long-term transport into the stratosphere, and then also the shedding off to the west and to the east. So the shedding off is what I'm going to talk about briefly next. This is model work from uh, Wacom. This is looking at carbon monoxide. So here is a, a latitude slice. You can see the latitude here. And then as a function of pressure altitude, this is, uh, as you can see, the carbon monoxide lofted up to the UT. And if you look at roughly the 150 hectopascal, that's what represents this map here. So you can see the elevated carbon monoxide within the anticyclone. And then what happens are these periodic horizontal shedding events that will move, that will take some of this air and then shift it out to the east over the western Pacific. Again, if there were any oceanographers on here and I lost you for a bit, this concept should sound familiar. Right, this, this would be this eddy shedding. Um, so this eddy shedding is actually, in the atmosphere, is what we would look at next summer during the Asian summer monsoon chemical and climate impacts project. So July and August 2021, we will be participating as part of AWOS, we'll be on both aircraft. Um, the NASA WB-57, yes, from Poseidon, and the NSF NPAR Gulfstream 5, yes, from GHC soon. They will be back, they will be together, and we will be there as part of AWOS looking at this system. The two aircraft are going to be used because they can cover different altitude ranges and different horizontal ranges. The G5 can't get up as high, about 13 kilometers is where they have to stick to their max. Um, the B57, though, can go higher, 13 to 18. And the goal of this study is to look at the impacts of Asian gas and aerosol emissions global chemistry and climate through this Asian monsoon uh, linkage, and then that larger scale dynamics as well. So just a little quick map of the region. We will be based out of Osan in South Korea. This cyan circle here is for the B-57's horizontal range, and then this purple circle here is for the G-5's horizontal range. And so as these shedding events come off, we will be able to encounter them and sample both horizontally and vertically. So hopefully we can uh, have another talk in the future and I can tell you what I find. I want to thank everybody for listening, both in person and here. I really appreciate you taking the time on your busy schedules and keeping up with my fast talking. I also want to thank the ton of people who made this work possible. I couldn't list all of their names individually um, because of multiple, multiple slides and all the funding sources. Just want to make a very quick call out to my original team. Um, was PI was Brian Heikis at URI. Sometimes team meant he and I, um, but still a team. And then the AWAS team that I'm now part of is PI's Elliot Atlas, which is much larger. And they are a great group of people. I'm looking forward to working with them moving forward. 
And I will leave you with like my two big conclusions. So from like DC3 project, from that you know, really in the thunderstorm scale, I was able to show the deep convection lofts soluble formic acid to PT, and that the scavenging efficiency seems to be around 60% based on the work done. Of course, ideally, it would be nice to have another campaign like this with all the things we learned from DC3, um, with the two aircraft again, and then looking at the organic ethics this time, get a better handle on their scavenging. And then from Poseidon, there was this long range transport of these Asian um, emissions that we were able to sample in the remote Pacific upper troposphere. And then the thing to keep in mind beyond this cool, the coolness of how this long range transport works is that, in particular for these VSLS species, this is dichloromethane, that this uh, shortens its time to get from the surface up to the stratosphere by rapidly moving into the atmosphere. So, thank you. And, uh, mute myself. Okay. Um, Thank you very much for this interesting presentation. Let's try to run the questions and answers through my laptop. So if someone from the audience has a question, I suggest that you activate your microphone and your camera and you speak to us. Paquita, is that? Yeah, I have a okay. question. My Can you video, hear? I, I wasn't able to turn on my video. So okay. My question is, I, I, I'm not a chemist. Is formic acid, that, does it interact with the cloud microphysics on the way, up, on its journey up? Like, it, is there cloud processing that happens of it? Oh, definitely, yeah. Um, so is there cloud processing of formic acid? So not that it impacts the microphysics necessarily, but that the microphysics impacts it. Is that something guessing what you're asking? Well, yeah, I mean, you're saying it's soluble. Yep. But then you're also talking about aerosol scavenging. And so I'm getting stuck thinking about What, what's going on? I guess, I guess it, is the formic acid going into the cloud microphysics and then falling out as precipitation? Is that is that what the yes yes? Um, so it's, it okay. is a when I say it's a fairly soluble species, I mean that it it preferences being in the aqueous phase over being in the gas phase based on its Henry's law constant, um, the choice it likes to make. So. Sort of the generalized assumption, if people ever think of a formic acid, is that if it's in this system, it's going to preferentially jump out as quickly as possible into cloud water, which can be rain, um, it can be grapple. But it hasn't really looked at, but it could get trapped also in ice as ice forms. Um, so the idea is a lot of it would be removed within the system. And by removed, I mean taken out of the gas phase into the aqueous phase. And so then as far as the model is concerned, as far as more chem is concerned, it's got burned. Okay. Does that help? So the reason why small storms might be more efficient scavengers is maybe because they have more warm rain? Or yeah, and well, and if they're slower, if there was more contact time. But uh, Bella's 2018 paper really looked into contact time, not for formic acid, but for formaldehyde and the peroxides, which are the big ones people usually look at, and found that overall contact time didn't have as much of an impact on the soluble species as we thought it would, which was interesting. Uh, but yeah, so the idea with the air mass, if they're if they're smaller, but if they're also kind of slower than the big ones, right? The vertical velocity was like 13 meters per second compared to MCS, it was like up to 50 sometimes. Um, so that would give the gas a lot more time to interact with the cloud water around it to then scavenge out the formic acid. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, do we have more questions? Yeah, I'm Hughes Elliott. I had a question. Okay. Um, uh, thanks very much, Victoria. Very, very nice talk. Uh, I'm, I'm curious about the uh, 
a suggestion of biogenic precursors producing formic acid. Mm -hmm. uh, and I understood you to uh, suggest maybe this is done in cloud. Um, out in gas phase, out of cloud. So are you asking about biogenic? So I'm also trying to make sure I'm good for the video. Yeah, the biogenic precursors. What is, you know, do you have candidate biogenic precursors that the idea that it produced in the cloud and, and, uh, and then, then uh, it's transported out of the cloud or it's in drain somehow and then you find it in the outflow. I, okay. I'm just curious what sort of precursors are good candidates for that sort of time scale of, of interaction. And whether excellent question. Um, or the type of chemistry. Yes, excellent question. So Elliot's asking about the biogenic precursors and uh, in the scale of things I wanted to talk about today, I couldn't get into full into, but I mean in the gas phase, not in the aqueous phase. So the thought process, they are one of their biggest, foreign gases' biggest sources in uh, secondary production is from isoprene and ozone. And so they're, from the aircraft video, while it was this storm outflow, it was this really kind of beautiful, cloudy, soupy mess at around eight kilometers. So there was convective outflow in the area as well as then the, once the cloud got there, they were evaporating in the sun. So from the biogenic precursor point of view, if those precursors had made it up to the UT and then had reacted instead, that could lead to formic acid production. Our original thought process for that region, thinking about that, was really was the formaldehyde, and the formaldehyde was turning into formic acid in cloud water, which was then evaporating in that region, uh, which is what we use a parcel model to look more at, and that's where the source was from. But things like the uh, isoprenes and any of the rest of the monoterpenes, if I had been able to see those either elevated in the same area, but they just, it's a toga data, and so it just wasn't in the same time scale, sadly. But it is gas phase chemistry I'm talking about for that. Yeah, thanks, sir. anybody else who has a question or a comment maybe not thank you everybody then yeah thank you again for the nice presentation thank you everybody watching it through zoom you can watch it again sometime this evening on the YouTube channel the link will be on the compass website and uh, as already announced on next Wednesday, Valeria will talk about a related topic here at the same place at the same time. And in between on Friday, we will have a Zoom only seminar by Ben Kirkman. I hope to see many people there as well. So thank you again um, and have a nice afternoon, goodbye.